Well, happy Friday, everybody. Normally, as you would know, if you follow the podcast, I do Q&A on Fridays. But this Friday, um, I took the opportunity to invite two people who were in town for... Actually, they weren't in town for jujitsu. They were in town for something else. But they are two people that I met through jujitsu. Both uh, individuals that I have an immense amount of respect for, both black belts. First is Henry Akins, a Hickson Gracie black belt. And then Dan Hart, who is a Henry Akins black belt. And at this point, I have traveled all over the world training with them. And why not sit down and do a little jujitsu roundtable? So for today... Full Auto Friday 108, we, of course, do answer some jujitsu related questions, but I'll call it a fireside chat. And with that, Full Auto Friday, number 108, with Henry Akins and Dan Hart. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Sun run, north and south, west of the smoke, west of the smoke. Okay, copy, west of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a Isn't it people ask me like why do you guys wear headsets the audio in these things is fucking good i thought we just did it so we could be like fighter pilots <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's the best start ever i feel like we from like a cinematic perspective the piece de resistance also known as maverick is that is it maverick or is it top gun maverick i mean it should be maverick if it's not yeah i'm not sure i'll ever see another movie again <laughs> Pretty hard one to top. Probably best movie of the last 10 years. I haven't seen many movies in the past 10 years. That's the first movie I've seen in a theater in years. And I feel like that's one, if you're going to watch it, it has to be in the big screen. Absolutely. Yeah. I did eat enough popcorn last night, though, that I woke up and I felt like we had gone and had like uh, a bunch of seafood, like this, <laughs> like my toes and fingers. Like I can always tell when I eat too much salt or ingest too much salt because I'll, I'll roll my nut and it's like, oh, God, no, it doesn't feel good. Swollen. Oh, it's so bad. Uh, all right. So this is going to be a Friday episode. A lot of times we do a Q&A. Like I said before we started, I'm going to do one question that kicks us off in the jujitsu direction, and then we can just talk about jujitsu as much as we want to. Henry, you've been on the podcast before. Mm-hmm. Dan, you have not. Um, probably the best to just let you both introduce yourselves, though. Henry, you can go first. Okay. So, uh, Henry Akins. I am a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. For how long, Mr. Uh, Akins? I have been a black belt now for... <laughs> I've been so long, I forgot. 19 years. <laughs> I was going to say, let's... I mean... 19 years. I have heard both of you and, and many other black belts say that there's a lot of levels at the black belt. Uh, yeah. Level. Actually, I've heard people say that there is more deviation at black belt than any of the other belts. So yeah, it's it's not like you got yours yesterday. You've been at it for a bit. I would agree. You know, and that, one of the things I always explain, like I've been a black belt for 19 years, so um, twice as long as all of my other belts combined. What was your longest belt? Uh, brown. How, and how long did you spend there? Four years. Dan. How long was I a brown belt? Yes. Four or five years. Hmm. I see a trend here. Yeah. Dan Hart happens to be a Henry Akins black belt. I'm not going to do the intro for you, but I'll just say it's interesting that both of you spent the same amount of time. <laughs> What's the saying? The apple falls not too far from the tree. <laughs> it's a lot. To, it's, it's a heavy weight to bear, the black belt. So got to make sure you're ready for it. I think that's fair. Dan, you get to introduce yourself. Dan Hart, uh, also a black belt. I'm a black belt under Henry. Been a black belt for two years. I'm living proof that anyone can achieve being a black belt, <laughs> no matter how unathletic you are. What does Howder say? It's not who, it's not who's good or the best. It's who's left. Yeah, so, something yeah. like that. Something I think like I that. Yeah. Added, either added or completely murdered that, but it's something along those lines. Right. Yeah, who's left? It's just yeah. sticking with it, right? And He's not, left. Not. He's still there. Crazy. That son of a bitch has talons for fingers did any of you guys take a look at his fingers at camp i did not yeah he he likes them grips <laughs> he's he's uh roached up yeah he's, yeah that son of a bitch tried to kill me at camp <laughs> uh, the key word is try with all of his might i've seen a lot of people and try to kill you Andy. was like well, to God, include you earlier today yeah, I, I tried it didn't go that way. what well. do you do to pass his guard yeah that was what I appreciated is he just did the same thing over and over again. And Leah had actually warned me about that. She's like, listen, 
double under pass. It's coming. And if it doesn't work, he's going to transition to the double under pass. <laughs> I was like, okay. He gave it his, he gave it his best shot. <laughs> How did you two meet? Because I know that you did not start Jiu-Jitsu, Dan, uh, under Henry. So I met Henry at a tournament, actually. He was a ref for one of my matches. I knew who Henry was um, and talked to him briefly, and then we chatted online. He was doing a camp in Costa Rica. I signed up for that and went down there and trained with him for seven, eight days, whatever it was. The first Costa Rica camp that he did, now Henry's doing camps all over, I think, quarterly now. Henry, is that right? Yeah, I try to do three to four a year is kind of the goal. I say we put Henry on the spot and say you have to commit to doing one a quarter moving forward. One a quarter. As long as, yeah. <laughs> I need to find find the locations. I, I, You know what? For me, it's all about the experience, right, with the camps. It's like finding just like an awesome place that everybody wants to travel to where y- you would go regardless whether there is jujitsu there, like yeah. to have an amazing vacation. But... While you're there, you get to train and get some like super high level training for a few hours a day. The setup we had at the last camp, the early morning, mm-hmm. and then the rest of the day to do whatever you want to do, I think was absolutely perfect. The first, the year previous, I think we did a couple double days. The split days, yeah. <sighs> Better pack a lunch and some salt. Yeah. Because yeah. those, those were some heavy days. But I think, what were we done by 11? Every day? Or yeah, ma- every day. Yeah. Well, and for you and I, our wives both train, but for some people that come with spouses and stuff that don't, I think, especially the non-split day, yeah. the heaven in the morning is the way yeah. to go. I've been fine-tuning that whole experience. You know, um, The thing for me, it was always like under-promise, over-deliver, and just give people, like try to provide people with maximum value. And um, from the feedback that I've gotten with the camps is like people actually want to enjoy it the vacation they're going they're going there on vacation but they want to do jujitsu also so give people enough time to really like go out and have fun and hang out do nice dinners relax um but enough jujitsu where after a week's worth of time they feel like they've been able to make a lot of progress so i find with those camps you get out of them what you put in i mean we how many times have we had this conversation 100 where i mean basically dan and i travel the, the world at this point to fight each other like he could just come here or I could come to Chicago and we could just fight each other. But it's like, let's go to Florida. Let's go to Costa Rica. We'll be in Vegas. Uh, this will come out of Friday. So it's already going to be June. We'll be in Vegas in June. Yeah. And uh, it is fascinating to me. And I'm curious your thoughts on this for both of you is when a bunch of people will show up to a seminar, let's just use uh, for easy math, we'll say 50 people show up. Anecdotally, what I have seen is maybe 20 will stay after enroll i think that's high why do you think that is though because i think there's a ton of value from my perspective in my optic i'm i think i'm three and a half years maybe just over three and a half years um to me there's an an immense value in the curriculum that you teach Mm. but there's also an amazing amount of value to roll with people that i don't see Right, that you Every don't day. get to train with. My training often. partner's a block away. I could I could honestly probably tell you their opening move and probably their first five steps, and I'm sure they could tell you mine. Right. So getting to slap and bump with people that you never see, and it's amazing to me as soon as the training is over, it's like, poof, these people leave. And I get, like, if we're in Costa Rica and you want to go surfing, like, yeah, roger that. But the same people are the ones who are on the mat every single time. Every time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think for some people – after a couple hours of training, they're like, okay, that's enough for me and brain overload. And they, they want to just go and kind of like, um, decompress, decompress, let that, you know, let whatever they learn that day simmer in. Um, obviously rolling, you know, mat time has a tremendous amount of value and, and just the ability to train with other people that, that throw different problems at you. Right. Yeah. They, they move differently. They feel differently. They react differently. So that definitely has a ton of value. And so I think, but, you know, I, I think there's always that more is better. There's a mindset more is better when it's actually not. So I think some people are just content with like, hey, I got what I wanted out of today. Like I made, you know, X amount of progress and I learned this and that's good enough for me today. And I'll be back at it tomorrow. But how yeah. do they really know? Because progress in a drill, at least in my mm. opinion, is a little bit different than progress when you're being smashed. Like, well, hey, this yeah. worked in the drill, 
but does this work when I'm in a shitty position and my heart rate is super high and I'm right. also being suffocated? And I don't know how to replicate that other than a live, a live roll. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, with the positional training, like we do, we do quite a bit of positional training in the camps, and so um, I think that's one of the things is like just having having the knowledge to whatever problem is is kind of the first step, right? Okay, I have the knowledge to know how to deal with that problem and then being able to execute it is the second thing, right? Execute it in live training. And so, um, yeah, for some people I think, okay, now I know what to do. I'm gonna go home and take this home and practice it, right? So I think what Dan is about to say is that a lot of people are pussies. <laughs> that that could, could be it as well. Um, I think there's an essence of truth to that. Yeah, I, th yeah, I think it goes both ways. I mean, yeah. some people just don't want to roll outside of their school. And I mean, Andy travels a lot. I travel a lot. I'm always looking for places to train. I mean, when I come out to Vegas, I have a place in Vegas, as you both know, and I get to train with Henry, but I drop in schools in the area and get different looks at people. And I want to make sure what I'm doing works on different styles and I want to experience new and, and different stuff. And I do think a lot of people are just, and some of it may be that they're scared to get hurt. I don't know, but I think generally speaking, they, you I think know. that might be definitely probably one of the things, right? Like everyone's kind of afraid to train with spazzes. And you know what is interesting, especially like at my camps, um, it, it tends to be a crowd that's kind of more towards their forties, like yeah. a, like a, um, a the little bit, we call them the statesmen. The Those statesmen. of us in our fourth decade, which I think we all are at this table, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. Definitely. I am we're definitely the that. statesmen then. That's what we're calling it from here on out. So, <laughs> and, and, you know, just getting, getting injured is such a, it's so frustrating. And I've been, I've had so many injuries, um, through my years of training where I've had to take time off and man, besides, uh, just the frustration of not being able to do what you want to do. It's a, it's a mental challenge because like for me, jujitsu is therapy, right? It's like very, very therapeutic to be able to do it. Um, and so not being able to do what you love. So I think that that could be it too. Um, but I, I think each individual will probably have their own reasons why they choose not to roll right after. I mean, we, those are pretty, you know, when we do like the camps, it's, it's two and a half, three hours of, yeah. of jujitsu already. And so, um, it's it's a lot of jujitsu, um, and some people are usually like, okay, I'm gonna it's time to go eat or time to so I don't know. Do you know what's better than two and a half or three hours of jujitsu? Four hours, five, five hours, three and a half to four. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, what? I, I I've tried that, and I'll tell you what. Well, you guys have noticed this. You guys you guys are are very unique in that, um, in that perspective because you notice. I mean, you guys are the ones that want to keep training after everyone leaves uh, when. In general, most people that's that's enough for them. So I, I think it tends to be very very unique with you guys. You guys are just obviously highly um, motivated, driven, successful in whatever careers or whatever paths you guys have chosen. Um, I just really love doing it. I'm fascinated yeah. by the fact it's it seems impossible to master. It's fun. It's a great yeah. workout. I mean, I I want to do it more, not less. And and I'll be, I, I'll be honest. You know, the training methodology that I had in my old job is, you know, you don't rise to the level of, what is it? You don't rise to the occasion. You fall to the level of your training. Right. 100%. I would much rather know how I perform completely exhausted. Maybe I should have stopped and gotten a meal. Maybe I'm a mm -hmm. little bit under-recovered because to me, that seems to be more like when life is going to challenge me, not right. when I'm like fresh out of bed and I had my 6.7 ounces of fucking, you know, protein with my, you know, slices of mango I, I right. have no idea why I just chose mango because I'm not a fan of it but my acai bowl since we're talking about jiu-jitsu which you crushed one today that was giant that for people who watch it was seven times the size of this well <laughs> all the world champions say hey it's the acai bowls that uh help them be so jack so I'm looking forward to that six pack coming in pretty soon when I think in terms of injuries too we all at this table at least have trained with injuries i mean it's yeah. my job to be able to a tap fast enough yeah. and to protect myself you know my shoulder's been hurt for a while i keep it away from people if somebody gets a hold of it i'll tap so okay. henry's first seminar in montana i was in a sling yeah you know, I remember. and i still showed up and just to try watch. to watch to watch and today i mean i was rolling with henry and <clears throat> you guys are not going to believe this but i was not winning uh for clarity. weird i was uh, i've never experienced that totally before. right i was belly down and somehow that was weird um, I was being choked, and I had my arm <laughs> at the same time. And, and he was I, eating a sandwich. 
Yeah, and it's like coaching uh, four other groups at the same time. I but, think I was mentioning, no, Andy, don't give me your back like this. <laughs> Why are you lifting up your chin like that? But that I was feeling that residual from that, and I, and I was even told him I tapped. I'm like, man, it's crazy how much I can still feel that. And my best way to avoid it is as soon as somebody grabs my arm like that, I'm like, next. Like, yeah, I'm done. Like, after yeah. two years, nothing to prove. It's and it's just that weird angle. I don't know what causes it, but uh, yeah, I know what causes it. Yeah, me Putting too. Your elbow in the, the kimura grip <laughs> yeah. is what causes it. Question for Note you: two self. part, two part question, Long Henry. Andy's right arm. And actually, I'll, you're a coach too, Dan, and you own a gym in uh, in Woodstock. So, four years at Brown Belt, and you had Dan as a. Did you? Uh, you were a purple belt when you met Henry, right? Yeah, Henry. So, the only belt I got from Henry was my black belt. Okay, so he trained for you or under you uh, for about four years before he got his black belt ish. Yeah, I mean, he, he was coming out to all my camps. Uh, he would come out to L.A. Um, and train at the school. I was coming out to Woodstock to um, do seminars at his school. So we had been training together and um, probably probably more than more than four years. Five or six, I think, yeah. it ended up being. So here's the question. How did Hickson know that you were ready for your black belt? And what was it about? <laughs> no, and I, Well, I'm fascinated because we were talking about this when it comes to belts and ranking people there's no published standard you guys are both coaches and you you taught for a very long time as a head instructor so i'm curious as to why you would think that hickson thought you were ready and then what was it about dan's training where you realized or what are you looking for for that last final step um i feel like i might have touched a nerve on when <laughs> hickson gave you your black belt. that was accidental by the way <laughs> To be honest with you, uh, <laughs> the reason that I think I got my black belt was um, they wanted, they needed a black belt instructor at the school, and you, you know, were like the senior brown belt. I was, yeah. I mean, I was, I was already very, very um, performance wise, you know, as in my ability to roll and do well with um, other black belts. I mean, I was holding my own with. Um, really really experienced black belts already um so i i think part of it was you know he knew performance wise i was there but i think what really kind of tipped the scale was we had another instructor that was a black belt that was kind of the head instructor at the school that left and opened up his own school and they're like okay well you know we can't have a brown belt teaching all the <laughs> yeah all the classes and so i i think that was probably a motivating factor i mean it's not and it's kind of known within that associate Hickson's kind of lineage. Like Hickson is not um, is very stingy with the belts, or was very stingy with the belts. Um, it took forever. Like the first two guys, the first guy, American guy that got a black belt from Hickson, it took him sixteen years. Uh, the second American guy that got a black belt from Hickson, um, it was fourteen years. So I didn't expect to get a black belt from him anytime soon and like for me it was just like show up and just train every day and i don't really care about the belt and even when i got my belt we you know we mentioned i was talking about this earlier like i ne i didn't feel i deserved my black belt at all i didn't want the black belt when i got it um, your optic for your coach and black belts though could not possibly be more skewed <laughs> in the environment that you came up underneath and it's like the same thing you and i have talked about this i may or may not have asked dan i'm like hey man like, what's the best you've ever done with Henry? And he just starts laughing. He's like, fuck. He's like, I think I got out of side control one time. <laughs> so the optic gets skewed, you know? And then you're like, holy shit, that, like, that's my new standard. <laughs> but I, I think all of us, right, we, 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 we measure our standard by who we train under, who our instructors are, who, you know. Um, so, yeah, that was, it was a very high standard. And, and I, that's, you know, that was one of the reasons why I specifically – when I started jiu-jitsu, I moved from Oklahoma to train with Hickson. I'm like, I want to train under the best dude in the world. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I knew that it was going to be a high standard. I wanted it to be hard. I wanted it to be difficult. I wanted it to be, um, at the time when I when I first moved to L.A., you know, no American had ever, ever get, gotten a black belt from Hickson. So it was already kind of, it wasn't a possibility at the time because it had never happened. And so for me, it was just like, hey, just show up every day, put in the work and, um, eventually it'll happen as long as you don't quit. So, uh, yeah. So how do you know when somebody is ready for their black belt? 
Um, like for Dan, as an example, four years as a brown belt. Is there like a moment where you watch, you see something happen and you realize that the technical proficiency and knowledge is there? Is it a, is it a combination of things? Yeah, I, I think for me as an instructor, one of the things is you, you have to judge each individual by their own abilities and their own potential. That's one of the things I actually learned from Hickson. Um, we used to do these belt tests and uh, we were doing a belt test and these tests were like eight hour tests. Right. Um, I'm going to just state that I find that to be a little bit excessive. Yeah, it was <laughs> just gnarly. a little bit and excessive. It's, 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 it's a training slash class, but eight hours in one day is just, it's brutal, right? Um, and one of the guys that I didn't think deserved the belt got, you know, passed the test and got his belt. And I, I'm marking the guy's sheets, we're grading them. Um, and I just thought that he didn't do so well by my, in my perspective on the test, but Hickson gave him his belt anyways. Um, and I was like, Hickson, you know, why did you give him the belt? And he's like, look, the guy's 50 years old. Hmm. He's, uh, comes in consistently every week. He's never going to be a world champion, you know? Um, and so, you know, you have to base this guy on what you think his potential can be. And that's the thing. It's like with, in jujitsu, each individual, like after you've trained with someone long enough, after you've, you know, kind of the potential that they have, right? And you see some people in jujitsu are extremely gifted, extremely talented, and you're like, wow, that guy's going to go really far. And then some people you train, and you're just like, wow, you know, that guy, he's super uncoordinated. It takes him super he's long talking time. About like, me. I was going to say, he's, we're actually sitting right here, Henry. Yeah. So if you could describe. So I just never else. thought Dan was going to get any better. So I was just finally like, <laughs> look at I can't, when I'm actually talking to him. Yeah. Yeah. I can't get him to quit. So yeah. I'm just going to give him I a can't black belt. Get rid of this guy. So. <laughs> So, yeah, some guys, some guys just don't, you know, so you have to, I, I think it's so much of it is just basing it on the potential. Now, for me, one of the big things too is and I think, um, you know, I talked to Dan about it. Like just, I, one of the big things about a black belt is having enough knowledge to be able to that, pass on the art to others. And Dan was already teaching a lot at his gym. Um, and so he was already putting in the work to, to teach it and, I mean, teaching is an art in itself. It's a skill in itself, right? Yeah, like you get more. better the more you do it. And um, some people just can't. Some yeah, people some people are teach. horrible teachers. Well, some people just don't want to. I mean, I have students and I've seen other black belts that are like, I have zero desire to teach. I just worry about me. I want to train and that's it. I worked with some people who were, fuck, they could perform at a level that I wish that I could have performed at, but they could have, they could not have taught the most gifted students sitting in front of them. That just for whatever reason, I just they were not tooled to be able to do that, but they were so phenomenal. Yeah. And I heard many of the guys that are the best in the world at what they do are terrible teachers. And I think the explanation I heard, and it made sense to me, was a lot of times these people are so gifted, they're kind of what we call like a natural at it, right? They pick things up, they just have this kinesthetic feel, and so they don't really have to think about it. And the people that struggle with it more actually have to think things through and kind of have to figure it out in their head how to do it. And so they become the better teachers. Hmm. And then you have very few individuals that are like extremely gifted at both. That Bridge can, the gap. Yeah, that yeah. can break it down, but also perform it. Um, and that's one of the things like I, I always say with Hickson, um, he's not the greatest of teachers when you have to like visually, audially, um, when you have to hear him speak, he doesn't articulate things well. Um, visually, you know, some of the stuff he does is so subtle, it's hard, but when he can put his hands on you, he's like an A plus teacher. But if you have to watch him on like video, he's like a C plus. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's like his level of knowledge of jujitsu is insane, but you have to almost like pull it out of him. You know, where he even says like, you know, he, he, his brother Horian, um, he always considered Horian the best teacher of, of all the brothers just, and Horian's just uh, amazing at articulating what's, what's in his head. Dan, you have not given a black belt yet, correct? No. What are your thoughts on what makes somebody ready at that final stage? Because I, um, obviously we can leave the names out of it, but you have people at your gym that will one day, cause they're, they're never going to stop cause they're crazy like all three of us sitting at this table how will you know 
I mean, some of that stuff, obviously, I defer to Henry on. I mean, I've had Henry tell me before about certain students, like, hey, why haven't you promoted this person? I have trained with them a couple times, and I think it's time, and we've had conversations about... they've been a white belt for seven years. (laughs) (laughs) You know, we've had conversations about why is this, you know, person still here, you know, whatever. And I think, you know, for me personally, um, I don't think I would be interested in having a black belt that was not able to teach and didn't want to teach. I would suggest they go somewhere else and there's different flavors to jujitsu. I know we've, you know, all talked about that endlessly and, you know, the things that I'm interested in, the things that I teach are all fundamental self-defense based jujitsu, real world stuff. And, you know, if someone's not interested in doing that, then I'm not the instructor, you know, for them. But in terms of what it takes to get, you know, to black belt at this point, you know, I've been two years a black belt, so I'm a ways from giving one out, but, you know, I would, probably talk to Henry about it, see what his thoughts were, but definitely being able to teach the art. I think it makes a difference the kind of person someone is. I'm not going to promote someone probably period, much less to black belt. That's going to have my name on it. You know, that I don't think is a good quality human being. Yeah. You know, one of the things um, we also talked about when, you know, we talked about like promoting people is it's really interesting with people that I've promoted throughout the years. Some people are not ready for the belt, but when you give it to them, they mm. rise to the occasion. I've heard you say that and before. And some people, you know, are, are are ready for the belt. And I think that, um, who was I talking to the other day? One of the, uh, oh, Ari from, yeah. from and Just got his black belt. Just got his black belt. And he said, definitely, um, and, and, you know, we were talking, because I said, you know, I had a very similar experience. I didn't feel like I was ready when I got my black belt. Um, I. You know, I was just like, wow, it's, this is a very heavy burden to bear because you feel like you have to represent. So it put a lot of pressure on me um, and it forced me that pressure forced me like, OK, I really got to step it up. I really got to step up my training. I really got to, you know, get better and perform. And um, just that pressure made me better, I think. And he said, yeah, ex- absolutely. He goes, that's what I feel right now is like I feel like I wasn't ready for it. But the pressure, you know pushes you to do do better than what you thought you could or yeah. you know well, where I, you were i think it's easy to get complacent at a belt too i mean at purple belt i felt like i was super comfortable i was a good purple belt i could catch a fair amount of black belts but there's nobody expected that much out of me i was a purple belt and then once i got promoted i instantly went to master's worlds and got absolutely demolished <laughs> like lost like a million to zero first match i was overweight i had to like cut to make heavyweight And I'm like, okay, so we're not there yet. And that's when I really started tracking all my training. You know, I keep metrics on it on how many hours. And I'm like, it's time to really step up to this. I don't feel them at all at this level yet. And now people expect me to be a brown belt and I'm not. So the imposter syndrome is something I've heard, I think, from everybody beyond white belt. Like everybody has said the same thing. I think that's, I actually would worry if you didn't have that. If if not you guys, but like just in general, people like, Fuck yeah, I was ready for that bell. Be like, whoa, take it easy. <laughs> well, there's such a huge range, right? I, I mean, at every belt level, and I mean, especially the black belt level, but at every belt level, there's such a huge range of performance level. Right? Yeah. So, yeah, you get a white belt with 20 years of D1 wrestling, and yeah, you got a problem on your hands. Well, we were just talking about, you know, ADCC trials. There's guys that are in jiu jitsu, blue belts, winning ADCC trials that are phenomenal athletes phenomenal at wrestling other stuff and probably in their jujitsu knowledge ranked appropriately and people can't wrap their heads around it but they're better at all the things that are going to win them tournaments yeah all right we're going to take it to the other end of the spectrum you're talking about black belts this is a a flavor of this question is the most common thing that i think people will reach out about um starting jujitsu a how should I start? And it's a lot of the times it's, this is how old I am. This is how much I weigh. This is the shape that I'm in. Should I get started? My answer is always just like, yes. Cause one of the most common things people will say is I feel like I need to get in shape before I start, which I think it kind of handles itself. If you just start and you have realistic expectations and actually can train and take some time off and eat well, but picking a gym is Uh, both of you have owned gyms and are coaches. So I'll read this whole question and then I'll I'll be curious to hear your thoughts. So it is time to find a gym and start training. Locally, I think there are two choices for me here in Birmingham and I'll leave the names out of it. Have a a good friend who's been at the ladder for the last four years. And of course he speaks highly of them. Uh, My friends at, at, at other gyms said that they are purists and all roll in a gi all the time. 
And his impression of the other gym is that there was more of a mix of both cultures, gi and no gi. So it looks like we have a full gi studio only and one that will do both. Uh, since you and Leah were just in the area, can you shed some light on that, the methodology between gi and no gi? And what else, if you had to do it over again, you would look for in a gym to start training? Uh, not sure if age matters, and frankly, it doesn't mean shit to me, but I'm 39. I'm not overweight. I'm in great health. Like I said, they always kind of lay them out in that order. Um, and I've also heard you mention mat culture before and understand that that concept and what it is. So I'm not looking for a gym to just show up day one and start sparring and wreck my body right out of the gate. So he has an understanding of kind of what he's looking for. But if you were in a populated area that had choices like this, um, I guess the only thing that he didn't have in this area would be I would say something more along the 10th planet lines, which would be no gi only. Mm -hmm. um, where would you start somebody? If they have options, where would you recommend somebody start their journey? So the, the first thing, and I think the most important thing is, is what are you looking to get out of jujitsu, right? That, I think that is the most important question because there's many reasons that people train. Some people are looking for a sense of community, like, hey, I wanna exercise, I wanna, you know, but I'm looking for a sense of community, I wanna make friends, and this is an activity that you do every day. And, I mean, many people find a lot of their closest friends, like all of us met through jujitsu, yeah. right? So a lot of people find a lot of their close friends and community through jujitsu. Um, some people are doing it to lose weight. Some people are doing it so f to learn how to defend themselves. Um, and a lot of the jujitsu out there now is more focused on competition and tournaments than self-defense. So I think that's kind of the first question to ask, what are you looking to get out of jujitsu? Um, I think many people, when they start jujitsu, hey, I heard it's a great you know, workout. Um, there's all these schools. So there's definitely some schools that are more focused with a like understanding and learning self-defense mindset and other schools where they're more focused on winning competitions, which is, um, there's a big disparity between those. So I think that's that's the first question. And if, uh, if you're just, the other thing too, I think after that, after you answer those questions, um, is go and visit the school and see how the classes are and meet the instructor and talk to the instructor because different people learn differently. And some instructors are just going the way that they break down information, the way they explain things, it's just going to resonate better with different students. For somebody who has never done any jujitsu, would you, if they had the choice between a gi specific school mm -hmm. uh, and a no gi specific school, which one would you start them on their journey? So my preference is to train both gi and no gi. And the reason for that is because people that tend to only train in the gi, what ends up happening is the gi becomes a, um, a tool for them. And we start learning how to control people with specific grips. And I think people that only tend to train in a gi end up starting to rely on those grips way too much. So you know, and of course my mindset is always self-defense, like practical self-defense. Can I use what I'm learning to protect myself or protect other people? Um, what happens is in a, in a real fight in a, many times the people don't have like big jackets on to, or sleeves to be able to grab, um, or, you know, you're wearing shorts, so you don't have pants that you can grab and control them with. So, um, for me, that was always important that my, my jujitsu is effective regardless of article of clothing. Fair. Dan, what are your thoughts? Somebody starting off? So my thoughts are a little bit different. Um, I think the proximity to where you live or work and your schedule are super important. Um, to make it convenient? Yeah, I mean, we live in an area or an age now where there's jujitsu schools everywhere, right? Um, when it I Depends on where you live. I get yeah. some emails like, hey, I'm 200 miles from a school. Yeah, so then you've got no choice. You're gonna have yeah. to go whatever's closest. But if you're in a metropolitan area, there happens to be a bunch of schools. I mean, I would look at what their class times are, look at what your availability is. All schools offer a free trial. I've never heard of a school that doesn't. I'd go to multiple schools, try them out. And at the end of the day, you're a customer. So I would recommend not signing a two, three, five year contract. Pay the extra to do month to month. Go there for a month, it, the one you like, and see if it fits. See if you like it, and if you don't, go somewhere else. If you don't jive with the people, do whatever. You shouldn't feel bad about leaving a school if it's not your flavor, it's not what 
you know, you want to do. But if there's one school that you can make it three or four times a week due to their scheduling and proximity to your house, and otherwise you're going to have to drive an hour to get somewhere and you're only going to be able to train one day a week, even if the jiu-jitsu is maybe not exactly what you want, I think you're way better off going there and being able to train more. You can always supplement your training on things like Henry's website or other people that have stuff you really want to learn. And at the end of the day, mat time, just being on the mat really makes a difference. There's camps, seminars, other things, you know, that you can go to, but most people looking for a gym aren't looking to be a world champion. They're not looking to be a, you know, UFC champion. They're looking to get in shape, have fun, meet new friends and learn how to defend themselves and do things. And I think, with some outlier exceptions at most schools, you can achieve all of that. I know there's some strictly sports stuff and things like that, but I'd rather you be able to train three to four times a week than once a week because, you know, you're driving further and doing those things. It's fair. Yeah, I think the volume matters. Do you think that there is a risk for uh, schools that are incredibly competition focused to dilute the efficacy of jujitsu in general because they are – training i mean let's be honest right competition if you're going to go and have a judge and you're going to have scorecards there's going to be a rule set you're going to play inside of it, and, it, and if you want to do good in that competition you're an idiot to not train inside of that rule set yeah yeah i but- mean all the guys look look to be exceptional in in whatever you're trying to achieve you're always going to try to maximize your your time right um get maximum value and so you know if you don't have to stand up and learn takedowns if you can just sit to the ground and, and you know, why not do that, right? So I, I think definitely depending on the rule set, um, you know, like jujitsu competitions, there's there's you're on a soft mat, right? And so there's a lot of things that happen on a soft mat that you wouldn't do in con- on concrete. So I, I think when people train, they they train based on what their focus is and that's the smart thing to do um and so i i think definitely like most of jujitsu is trained nowadays without strikes right that was not the norm when i first started training and so nowadays people think oh jujitsu means you're not punching each other but it's very weird to me that i actually have to make a distinction of training like jujitsu <laughs> with and without strikes because it used to be you know that's part of our training is is with strikes like you know, like, hey, you think this move is awesome? Well, pow! Yeah. <laughs> learning how to clinch, learning how to do takedowns, like learning all of that stuff was just part of how we trained. We used to. I remember we we would do clinching drills, and we'd have one guy with boxing gloves on, um, and you know, you're trying to get in and clinch him without getting hit, and the guy with boxing gloves is allowed to just tee off, <laughs> and so you would just literally get guys like pop 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 pop, like getting cracked, you know? Yeah. And you have but that's you, real though. Sixteen ounce gloves, so yeah. it's it's you know it's safe in a way where you're probably not going to get cut. But, I call um, that safe-ish. Yeah. You're still getting your head cracked if you if you come in improperly, if you don't have a good defense, if you're not timing your so um I and I it's so funny, I go around and ask us how many you know, when I teach how, how often do you guys train clinching? Nobody ever trains clinching with strikes. Why? Because you don't need to learn that when you're competing in tournaments or when you're training at the gym, most people, how does, how does most training start? People slap hands and they're well, on the ground already on your yeah. knees. So one standard or one standing, one seated or both yeah. or, seated. Right. So it's just not, in. they're like, why would I need to train for that? Because that's not how they, they, the practice is. And so that's not what they're training for. So yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I, I, you know, that's a huge portion of jujitsu that I see obviously gets very, very little time and attention, just the whole clinching, yeah. like learning how to clinch. And then uh, obviously the, the next portion is, is taking takedowns, taking the fight to the ground, which is a huge part of jujitsu, which also is, is quite neglected because in jujitsu tournaments, there's no penalty for just sitting down. Well, you have to have one point of contact. There you go. You can't just sit. I think you have to have a, like, depends on the tournament. Yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Dan? Um, a little bit different. So, you know, I do believe that jujitsu is getting watered down, but I believe very different reasons. I think jujitsu starts getting watered down when student retention starts being more important than standards and uh, teaching things correctly. I think the idea that a lot of people take, and I hear people say this, you know, oh, well, those guys do sports jujitsu, 
so it's not like as good or whatever. I mean, I think it's ridiculous to say that someone like Gordon Ryan or whoever, who these guys were the best in the world under any grappling rule set, aren't going to just absolutely destroy people, even in an MMA setting. What they're doing works. Yeah. It's going to work. It's just a different style. And like Henry said, they're going to train within their rule set. Will you be an idiot not to? Yeah, of course. And they're doing. Th- they're getting paid tons of money now, which is awesome. But that is not watering down jiu-jitsu. And some of the hardest roles, some of the most aggressive physical roles I've ever had are with high-level sport guys. I mean, they're absolutely amazing athletes. So... It is different, and I believe what Henry's saying to be true, stuff you wouldn't do if it was concrete instead of a mat. There's some differentiations there. It's just a different art or a different sport. But when people take the stance that that's not jujitsu or it's watered down, so to speak, I mean, those guys are killers too, and you know, most of those guys would destroy me. I mean, there's no chance I'm going to go you know, to roll with someone who's winning ADCC and last any length of time at all. But I do think jujitsu is getting watered down, but that's more of a monetary you know, student retention, building huge gyms and trying to make money. It depends on on what you mean by watered down, though. I mean, I think that's important to to distinguish because when you talk about, you know, efficacy, like, is it effective in a, in a, like, jujitsu is constantly evolving, right? And you see modern athletes are constantly getting better. Their nutrition is more on point. Their athleticism is going through the roof. Better steroids. Um, that, that is continuously the, evol- evolving the, as well. Right. Um, but also the techniques, you know, the techniques are becoming more refined. People are evolving. Um, so, yes, in a, in a way, like jujitsu, when you think about, like you, you mentioned the hardest roles you've ever had is just grappling with these high-level guys. But once you add striking into the mix, like – it's you it's very tough to say that a guy that just trains rolling when you introduce striking into the mix is going to be as effective as a guy that trains consistently all the time dealing with strikes yeah well that, that's when you start getting into the argument of literally how the ufc was started right if no one can take a guy down and a guy's striking is so high level and now the ufc rules have changed right it doesn't favor grapplers it's very hard to in that time frame get someone to the ground you know, maybe they don't need to know much on the ground. One of the things I liked about the SPG camp is at the end, they lined up all the coaches and asked them what piece of advice they would have given to their mm. earlier self when they first started. I was curious what your answers would have been when asked the same thing. What advice would you give yourself at the beginning of your journey looking back now? Gosh, that's a tough one. I mean, there, there's so many important lessons that I've learned on the way. Um, I guess as a, as a white belt, what is the most important thing? I mean, for me, always the most important thing is tr- try not to use strength. Try to take your physicality out of it, right? Because um, not that, easy to do. It's not easy to do because, again, like when you think about wanting to win or wanting to perform well a lot of times mindset we always go to, if I try a little bit harder, I can get things to work, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like if I just put a little if bit I more- just in, squeeze a little harder. <laughs> yeah, and so um, I think that takes away from you, your ability to really refine the technique. And so I think that is kind of one of the bigger detriments to, to learning um, is, you know, trying to incorporate, I think people's performance is based, you know, 50% on your technique, 50% on your physicality. And so for us in the practice, we want to, the more that we can rely on the technique and the more we can take away from our physicality, the better our jujitsu becomes, the better, you know, skill that you're able to develop. And then you can always, if, if you are an athlete, if you combine your high level technique with your athleticism, then you're really a force to reckon with. Yeah. You're a wood chipper. I mean, I think the biggest thing for me, I started much later. Henry started young. You and I talked about this earlier today. I was in my 30s, as were you. Yeah, we were idiots. We yeah, so, I mean, but third decade. <laughs> similar to that question, you know, what gym do I start at? Just start. 
Yeah. I mean, just get started, walk in the door, do it. I talked about it for multiple years before I did. I wanted to fight MMA. I thought that was something I was very interested in. I had a few amateur fights once I started, but I had the opportunity to start five to six years earlier. And I talked to somebody at the event we were at last night who was telling me their coworkers um, are members of SBG that have been bugging them and bugging them and for five or six years. And they just now started like a year or two. And he's like, God, I wish I'd started when they started busting my balls about it. And you know, but if they were you were, if they were a white belt already, what advice would you give them? So if they already started, if they already took that step, and they were a white belt, what would you tell them? I mean, to me, it would be to spend as much time training as you can and focused on your technique, not worried about the belts, not worried about who you're beating. Um, you know, I think everyone falls into the trap of getting super competitive, especially. I mean, I'm a hyper competitive person. So there's been times certainly in my training time where I was super focused on winning at the gym. And, you know, we've talked a lot about very specific training. I think even if your gym is not doing positional training and even if you are a white belt and you're getting smashed, you can just focus on certain things. Like I know I'm going to get my guard passed, so I'm just going to work on getting out of bottom side control. I'm just going to work on, you know, these other things. I think highly specific positional training at the highest levels and the lowest levels is the most important thing that someone can be doing. And that's not something I started doing until way late. And the other thing would be to work on takedowns. Even that's, though I've been telling you for years <laughs> to focus on positional training. I mean, I mean, maybe we have an answer now as to why Dan was a brown belt for four years. <laughs> <laughs> but to work on takedowns, I mean, it, yeah. it's not something to the last few years that I've really put focus and time into. And that's something with my students, I try to force a lot and we have some wrestlers that are really good a couple of new guys that are super high level that are helping us out with stuff but like henry said earlier i mean there's a lot of people that can't take anybody down and that's a problem because especially if the whole time you spend training is to refine the skill that really becomes optimized on the ground yeah i mean fuck if you can't get it there i mean in fairness i won two of my mma fights by getting basically knocked out and falling to the ground and then they tried to jump on me and i was like ha <laughs> Now I've got you. <laughs> We're in my world. I don't know if that's the strategy to go with, even though Oliveira, I don't think he meant to do that, but damn, I for a second there, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to go his way. And then it really, 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 really rapidly went his way. Well, we can agree that it's a poor plan for longevity. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, let's not take years off of your life in the attempt of doing this. Do not block punches with your face. It's a good strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I thought he, I thought he had rung him enough that that one might have been over. And then the first time he knocked him down, he's like, "Yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not engaging no, in any not of going that down there. <laughs> in any of that I'll shit." I'll pass on, on, uh, yeah. yeah, jumping, jumping in between your legs. When did you start doing your camps? Um, the first camp that I did was probably six or seven years ago, and it was, it wasn't my own uh, camp. It was through a company uh, called Sub and Surf, um, and so they had that location in Tamarindo, Costa Rica, where they invited me down, and they were hosting different. Um, different instructors at the time. And so I was one of just a handful of instructors that would come out every couple months and do a, do a camp there. Um, and my camps, it, what's crazy is my camps, even though they had multiple like world champion guys, very, very competitive guys, my champs were the one that were selling out the, the most of all the guys. And so um, that was really interesting to me. Uh, and so everyone was having a great time and a great experience. And I was like, you know what? Um, they, the person that was running the camps got super busy with a lot of other businesses. Um, and so they, yeah, they, they just were not putting much time into the experience of the camp. And I just thought, you know what? Um, I, I really want to make this because I'm the one teaching and people are coming there for me. I think I can just create a really, really incredible experience with this for everybody and organize it, do a better job organizing it and stuff like that. So, I think the first time I did my own camp was probably four years ago, four or five years ago. I think it's like five or six because really? we, you know, during COVID we did nothing. Oh, that's right, COVID. Like we, yeah. That, Everybody forget, forgets like, about like two COVID years of COVID. Like two years <laughs> yeah, is just, just wiped that off. That two years where we, yeah, yeah. So since, I didn't train at all during COVID. I definitely <laughs> never trained a single time, <laughs> not once. Didn't even look at a mat. Yeah. There was a lot of newspapers being put up in windows <laughs> at facilities all around the world, probably. Uh, I asked about the camps. Um, I didn't realize you. I thought you had been doing them for longer. I th well, and I and I asked about it because I th I'm, I think it's been like eight or nine 2000, years. Two thousand. What was it? Two 
2012 or 13 is when I did my first camp. That's 10 years ago. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's so. The, but that ago. but that wasn't my own. That was through Sub. But yeah, the first, first couple surf. years. I think the first three or four years were through Sub and Surf because there was two in Costa Rica or three, and then um, I did Bali. Bali. Yeah, Bali with with Sub and Surf, and then and then after I think we did one more Costa Rica through Sub and Surf, and then I started doing it by myself. And so since then we did. Yeah, we've done Thailand. Um, we just did Destin, Florida, which was fun. It was just a I mini just Las Vegas. The Thailand one. I think that was the f- last one you did before I started going. Yeah, that was the straight- one that we did right before COVID. That yeah. was when uh, Dan was patient zero. Um, yeah, contracted COVID on the. It's way. also where I got my black belt. True. He also has given me COVID. He gave it to me the second time. I'm gonna get yeah. a T-shirt made that said Dan Hart gave me COVID. <laughs> It'll be on the website. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first one that brought back the original yeah. virus. That the alpha strain. Yes, and then uh, gave you the gave you, f- luckily, just the omicron. Yeah, it was lighter than the first round through. Yeah. Uh, no, I asked about the camps because I um, It has been one of the most beneficial things that I have done so far, um, and I don't just go to your camps. I go to all the SBG camps. I'm fortunate that I I have control over my schedule. Yeah. I get that people. Um, from either a time perspective or a monetary perspective, may not be able to. But Dan and I have talked a lot about this, and um, I don't think it's any shock that more and more people from Montana start filling up the Henry Aikens Mm -hmm. (laughs) jiu-jitsu camps like all over the place, because we'll come back from these things, and essentially what people will say is, hey man, what the fuck happened while you were gone? (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, And they want some of that action. It has been it has been for me. I think I've been to some of them have been like two day ones, but I think I've been to about eighty or camps now. And I just told so you. So you notice a big jump. You mean it notice I notice a big, a big jump. jump every time, and I think and your training partners notice that. Yeah, it's that targeted. You know, I think most of your longer camps are four or five days, but subject matter that you really dive deep into, and then you drill, and then you the way that you weave it into the subsequent days. I leave with a better understanding, and personally, I get a lot out of that type of immersion stuff then i love rolling you know i mean I'm not joking for people listening like dan and i travel the world to fight each other it's ridiculous it's true we could just go to chicago or here but it's like yeah let's just go other places um it has probably been the the biggest single lever for my understanding of jujitsu um going forward it, it's been awesome yeah the positional training with q a i think i think that's huge that's just something i i kind of thought about and I was like how do I give these people the maximum amount of value and like I, it could you know I I can pick a topic to teach and go really take a deep dive into that topic but it doesn't address specifically like what are these people's specific problems like what do they do so if I don't want to completely change someone's game let me see exactly what they're doing what mistakes they're making when they're trying to escape mount or hold mount or in each of these positions and let's just fine tune like let's fix these mistakes and so I think that drill you know where I do where I usually do like at least half the camp right one or two days three days if it's a if it's a longer camp of positional training with Q and a where people get to ask. But the other thing too, is like that I really, you know, try to get people to do is I try to get people to start thinking about jujitsu in a different context. Like, Hey, I want you guys to start identifying the problems that you're having, right? That's the first kind of step to improving or getting better is like start to identify, okay, where am I struggling? What are the problems I'm having? And then you can start to find the solution to that. And so, you know, before you guys do the roles, I'm always like, Hey, listen, if you can't get out of this position, it's a yep. problem. If they, if you're not getting, if you're in the dominant position and you're not finishing the guy, that's a problem. Like what, if, what attack are you going for? What are they doing to stop you? And so really like focusing in and, and being very, very specific, like what the heck is going on here? You know? I like it when you ask people before the positional sparring, does anybody have any questions? People are just like, well, and so people understand what we're talking about. I mean, Henry will say, for example, mount. So Andy will mount me for two minutes. Andy's job is to try to submit me. My job is to try to escape. Either of those things happen, we reset. And then usually in between, all right, who has any questions? Okay, well, hey, I was trying to get out. And every time I do X, Y, Z thing, Andy's shutting it down. Okay, show me exactly what you guys were working on. He shows, and then Henry makes adjustments. So I think you know, you've done seminars with other people. A lot of time it's very specific to that instructor's game. Whereas yeah. what Henry's talking about is so conceptual into your game. When I'm doing this, when Andy's yeah. trying to do that, here's what happens. And Henry adjusts, fixes it, does whatever. Then we switch top and bottom, same thing. I just love how nobody has questions generally before drilling. And then after the first two minute drill, it's like, so 
I had some things happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that You're was like, bitch, that didn't happen and for that the was first something... time. You know you've had that question for a long time. So there's another guy in my gym that <laughs> yeah. has this issue, not me. Yeah. That's so funny because that's that's what exactly was going on. We would yeah. do it, we would do Q and A days and I literally hey, I would just open up to questions and people would not have any questions. I'm like, Man, it's I know you guys have problems yeah. and, and maybe it's just not so you know what? I'm going to I'm going to create a situation where the problems are going to be right in your face. Yeah. You know, you think you don't have any problems? Well, now you're going to start training and trust me, problems are going to come up. I love what I love about the positional sparring is there's no reward for escaping. You go right back into the dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> so, your problems are going to come right to the surface. It's like, "Oh god, I just had this Herculean effort to get out." We have a minute and 50 seconds left. And I have to go right back into this position that I didn't want to be in. And I know the Destin camp sold out, but how many people was it? It was really small. 20. 20. And yeah, there was 20. like. And that was more based off the size of the gym. Well, it was 100%. But how yeah. many black belts were there? 10? Nine black belts out of 20. Yeah. So. Yeah. And I would say, kind of, I have no data to support this, but I would say most of the questions were from the black belts. And I, and I think that's good, meaning yeah. that. That, that they were they're seeing the value from that. Yeah. Um, one of the things I love the most at your seminars, I don't know if I've told you this directly, is when people will ask you a question. I know what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> so when people will ask you a question and you will say, show me what you're talking about. And then they start trying to fight you. Because it's not middle, really a question. In the middle of a drill. What they're really saying is, this is what I do. And, and it I works on everyone. I'm about to fuck you up right now in front of my peers. And I, I was I'm with, taking over the seminar. I was sitting next to Will. Uh, I won't name the exact seminar. We were all there recently in Florida. Um, but, and he's like, starts elbowing me because it was happening over. And we were dying laughing. They will literally ask a question. It'll be in the middle of a demo. And then all of a sudden, like a, a partial roll begins. Yeah, and now like, we're training. <laughs> it, it'll be more of a training instead of like a... The number of times that has happened at every seminar that I've been to, and it never gets old for me. It's one of my favorite things that happens. I don't know if you enjoy it, but I love it. I, it's, I think it's funny because I think they, they want to see if what I'm explaining really works against what the, what they're doing, you know? And so, I mean, that that's the other thing, like, you know, you you got you have to be able to, I, th I think as an instructor, it's important to maintain your level because at the end of the day, sometimes people want you to prove it to them. And that's the yeah. beauty of jujitsu is like, you need to go out there and, and prove that what you're doing or what you're talking about works, you know? Um, that's, the, that's the beauty of jujitsu, it really is. It's like, we're constantly proving it under live action, like 100% resistance, right? Like when you start rolling with someone, you know they're, they're trying to put you into a position where you have to give up, right? And they're gonna do everything within their power to prevent that um and so your job is to control them and you know get them to give up yeah what's your guys favorite thing about jujitsu favorite thing about jujitsu my I'm, favorite thing is that no matter how much you train you can always get better i mean it's it's to me that is so motivating and inspiring that no matter how much you put into it like you're going to keep getting rewards i mean you know you're you're you never there's no plateau there's no peak there's no like it sure feels like there is <laughs> well i was gonna say that's nice all plateau that's also my least favorite thing about jujitsu it's like every time i feel like you know what i'm really good at this then i'm like oh no there's another hill up yeah. there and like how am i going downhill now yeah, yeah. well and sometimes you know we've talked about that with some of the things i'm working on right now you got to get worse to get better sometimes yeah. you got to be un you have to be willing to have a degradation in performance to have a long-term improvement in performance. Actually, Casey Halstead told me this one time. He talked about when he was training under Eddie Bravo. Eddie was, and I don't remember what the position was, but something, and Eddie went and learned something from, I think it was Jean Jacques, his coach, and came back and was like, hey, this is how we're doing this now. And Casey's like, but you've always said to do it this way. He's like, yeah, I was wrong. You have to be open to being wrong. Yeah. And that sat well with me, like the idea, like you have to be open to being wrong. And once you are, admitting it to your students, your peers, hey, this works way better. And what I'm doing is not as efficient as that. And you know, one of the things I always think about that I got from Henry is how do I get the same or better results with less effort? If I know I can do X, Y, Z to someone, how do I do it faster, quicker, with less strength and less movements? 
So to me, maybe I can always submit so and so, but how do I do it faster, cleaner, quicker, with less effort? Yeah, for sure. What's your least favorite thing about jujitsu? God, that's hard to say. I mean, and it's probably because like I constantly go through in my injuries, head, like all of the. Yeah, I mean, it, injuries is not just jujitsu, right? It's just it's that's getting old, just life. <laughs> yeah, but um. I mean, there, there's a potential for injury in anything like, you know, stepping off the sidewalk wrong and you yeah. roll your ankle. Um, injuries do suck though, but man, for me, I've had, I think I, I was having a conversation with some of the other, I've, I've literally had two surgeries from that were specifically related to jiu-jitsu and they were both meniscus surgeries, right? And I've had no other kind of surgeries that I can directly relate to jiu-jitsu. Um, so I've been really fortunate in, in that regard. And I have had injuries, but things that I just need to take some time off and rehabilitate over time. But um, man, jujitsu, like when you look at the pros and you look at the cons, it's it's like a million to one for me, you know, um, how much value it's provided to my life as opposed to what I don't like or what, I mean, one of the other things too is it's hard as shit like it's, yes. it's it's hard right and and i man i love that it's difficult it's not easy and i mean the other thing i love man like i like today when i came in to train i was feeling like shit wasn't feeling great was super tired and by the time we got done training i think we were there for like an hour hour and a half like we got a solid two hours in actually feel yeah. like a thousand times better yeah and i was like man i walked in feeling like shit didn't really want to train but i like just i'm gonna do it because i need to you know i need to start getting back in shape i need to start and by the time i was done i was like man fuck i feel so much better i feel like 10 times better than when i walked in here and you can go anywhere in the world now and do that i mean I travel everywhere. You travel. You guys both travel. Yeah, there's gyms everywhere that let people drop in. That's kind of cool. Like the yeah. how the the growth of jujitsu is is been insane. I mean, I've rolled with a fair amount of people in my travels that don't speak English. But really? Yeah, I've been to other countries and some of the instructors and stuff too. But we've I've rolled with people. Hey, okay, cool. And that's awesome. We can do that and that interact insane, and actually. kind of speak to each other in that way and don't speak the same language. <clears throat> well, I don't want us to get yelled at by our significant others. So I want to close on, talk about the camp that's coming up. So this will come out next Friday, which is going to be June 3rd. Um, talk about the camp you have going on in June, where it's going to be, what people can look forward to. Yeah, so um, the next camp is going to be June 15th through 18th in Las Vegas at the Mirage. Um, we have a couple group dinners set up. That's one of the amazing things with the camp too, is just getting able to meet people from all over the world, train with people from all over the world. Um, we're, we're definitely going to take a deep dive into, uh, a very specific topic for this camp. And the, the topic for this camp that came up was just how to make yourself invincible. Um, that was always a big thing with Hickson is just the ability to, to train and feel so confident in your jiu-jitsu that no matter where what position you end up in, you knew you could stay safe and get out. Um, so we're gonna focus a couple of days on submission defenses and escapes and a couple of days on escaping the cross side, a couple of days on escape, or a day on escaping cross side, a day on escaping the mount. So those are tend to be kind of the two of the worst positions to end up in. Um, I would like to rec uh, request attacks from open and closed guard. I'm Maybe sure some guard passing. <laughs> 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 Haven't we done that at the last like three camps you guys have been at? Yes. Yeah. I need and about it's awesome. eight to 10 more years uh, before I'm moderately proficient. At it. And you have a separate website for the camps, yeah. correct? Yeah. Hidden jujitsu camps.com is, is the website. And then of course, if people want access to any of my teaching or any material that's on uh hidden jujitsu.com. So yeah. Uh, I'll close this one out. I'll tell you, it's the best money I've ever spent um, on my training in jujitsu. I feel, I love coming back from it. One, I get to hang out with super close friends, get to roll with you guys, learn from you guys, but come back and I, and it may not even necessarily be true, but I feel like every time I go to one of those camps, I come back and it's like, I'm a rung up the ladder. And maybe I only feel that way, but guess what? Who gives a fuck? Because that's how I feel. And it has literally been the best money that I've ever spent on it. And what I'll tell people listening is, don't sleep on the camps because if you do, they'll fill up. So if you have an interest in going, in my opinion, it's the best money you could possibly spend on your jujitsu. Absolutely. And I'll close it out like that. You guys want to go get second dinner? Let's get second yes, dinner. Second, second dinner. dinner it is. Sweet. 